only thing I can add to this is that I really feel honored and I feel also a real pleasure to, to, to be here among eminent thinkers in this field. Um, I have chosen a somewhat strange title for my thesis here. I will talk about the movement from unprobability to impossibility. And let me start with three quotations, more or less well known. The first one goes back to the ancient thinker Epicurus. Uh, to him, there is a sentence attributed that would lead us directly into a field that you would call a tragical urbanism. Because what he says is that, that human beings are able to take preventive actions against most things in the world, but with regard to death, we all are living in a city without walls. So, if a city is an Im immune system, in the most important case uh, in which immunity is required, it does not work. So we have to, to, to keep that in mind if I introduce you to the basic vocabulary uh, of the next minutes, which does not mean that I necessarily do the work. I deliver the concepts and I would suggest you make your own conference. Uh, two of these uh, concepts uh, have already been uh, named unprobability and impossibility. The term of immunity or Im immune systems is already here. And the second quotation I, I would like to uh, put forward uh, under the pretext of uh, an introduction uh, goes back to a famous saying of Aristotle. Uh, he said, a good architect has to build houses in such a way as nature would create them if nature, a physicist, would make grow houses. So you just have to shake a little bit the tree of houses and houses will fall down if they fulfill the, the perfect definition of what a house is meant to, to be. It is, it, is, it is meant to be an, a place of immersion where you can dive into, into, into this, the secrecy and the sheltering qualities of, of, of that place, especially during, during night time. Times uh, and to pro protect a, 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 a given unity of co cohabitation, which is usually a, a, a family. And now imagine what Aristotle would have said with regard to cities. You know, he, he would address almost the same sentence. With, with regard to, uh, to urbanists or uh, city architects, uh, build cities in such a way as nature would have built them if nature would make grow cities. But nature is not uh, silly enough to create uh, cities, yeah, because cities are, are, are places where uh, the improbable almost reaches the height of the impossible. And my third quotation will be from Richard Dawkins, a general formula for what he calls evolution. And he has found a very nice, a very pop popular and very poetic description 
It was to participate in evolution means to climb Mount Improbable. And the, the strange thing is now that this Mount Improbable is, is not a given mountain it, because it grows while you are climbing. This is a, it is a perverse mountain or a paradox mountain, uh, the height of which depends on the energy of the climber. So it's a co-evolution between, cli between climbing and, and growing peaks of improbability. Improbab and that is uh, what I meant if I call uh, my lecture from improbability to impos impossibility, because we, we are all uh, well uh, conscious of, of the fact that there is a, that's something tragical and, so, and something untenable about the con construction of, of big cities. They did not <laughs> exist until 250 years, and they will probably not exist from now on in, in 200 years. So when the, the peak period span of time of our main activity in our lifetime will be gone, and our main activity in our li lifetime is called burning the sub subterranean forests. That's what modern modernity finally is, is, is all about. Yeah. Uh, we have made this, uh, this fatal uh, discovery that one log of, of, of wood uh, cannot only be burned once, as our forefathers and ancestors believed. We have discovered uh, that uh, dangerous secret how to burn one uh, uh, piece of wood millions of times. Yeah. And this uh, pyromanic activity is, is the very essence of, of modern times and, we'll, and we already know very well that we are living in the end game phase of, of, of this uh, game called burning the subterranean forests. Uh, now, it's, that's your task. You, may, you have the, 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 key, the key terms and you produce your conference. Immune system, immunity, impossibility, immer immersion or uh, Em embedding procedures. And what is the result? In the mean, in the, while you are uh, elaborating your conference, uh, I deliver one version, uh, one possible version of uh, of the task uh, I gave I gave you, and one possible answer to the question has been delivered by Paul Valéry in his. Uh, well-known uh, essay uh, written in the uh, early uh, 20s of the last century, Oi Palinos, or the architect. Uh, so in, in every textbook for arch architecture students, this should be on the one of the first articles uh, you should read, just as uh, when, when it comes to the question of, of tragical urbanism, uh, the introduction of Giovanni Boccaccio's De Camerone should, should be re read and reread, re because this is uh, the, the description of what can happen if a big city is no longer able to fulfill its function as a, a collective immune system for in, its inhabitants. And he described what happened in his natal city, Florence, when the plague arrived in 1348. Yeah. So in a couple of uh, few months, uh, 100,000 people died due to, to the city's incapacity to deliver what it should del deliver to, to its citizens, that is, a, a higher level of immunity. But what happens is exactly the contrary. Nowhere 
life is that uh, endangered uh, when the, the city as a spatial light immune system does no longer work. So, but let me just uh, add one re remark ab about the Aristotelian task uh, of, of city building. It is a virtual task. He never really explained how nature would have done it. But from the constructive point of view, one thing is clear. The nature, if she really would uh, build cities, she would uh, seek for the uh, per perfect uh, equivalent, also a, a balance between immersive qualities of living in the city. That's something that is also discussed under the term of embedding. In, in, in modern sociological context, and on the other side of, of immunity, where immunity uh, can, uh, can be delivered at the same time as a uh, sort of an effectful form of uh, immo immersion structure, then the uh, nature as architect of the city would, would be satisfied. But let me add one uh, definition for what uh, immune system in a general in general meaning implies. You all know that immune systems are called as they are called since the late 19th century, when German and French biologists borrowed uh, from Roman law the concept of immuni immunity. The, the term immune system is, is not a biological expression. Uh, it is a juridical term uh, that which is borrowed from, from Roman law. And Roman law is based on the, on the, on the insight that all human uh, life uh, is under the risk of being damaged. And everything that is, can be done to prevent damage in the future belongs to the system of, of immunities. That's also one of the reasons why Roman law only has one uh, great problem, how, how to uh, restore injuries after, the, after, the, after damages. Yeah? You have, you have uh, in, inju injuries and reparations. Yeah? And an immune system is an in incorporated structure that anticipates damage in the future. The same thing if you are vaccinated. Uh, from the moment of the vaccination on, your body is prepared to encounter the inv invasions of certain microbes. Yeah. But at the very moment you, you, you uh, build a house, you and your family are prepared uh, to uh, silent nights, nights because the house as such uh, anticipates the disturbance uh, of, 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 your, of, your of your nightly life. Yeah. And everything that uh, incarnates the expectation of the future damage can, can be called an, an immune system. That, that is very important. And uh, that also belongs to the definition of, this, of the city. A, a well-constructed city has to be prepared for certain typi typical damages uh, and has to deliver uh, that kind of uh, immersion system that people really do, uh, do require. And Paul Valéry writes the following sentences. It ceases not to spur me to develop a couple of ideas on the art. A painting, my dear Phaedros, yeah. Socrates, uh, addresses to his favorite student. Dear Phaedros, covers a mere surface, such as a panel or a wall, but a temple along with its precincts, or again, the interior of this temple, forms for us a sort of complete greatness which in which we live. We are, we move, we live inside the work of man. 
We are caught and mastered within the proportions he has chosen. We cannot escape it. And this reflection places the emphasis on two different elements. The first is it insists that in the present case, the surroundings are sublime. It is, uh, we are speaking of, 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 a of a temple. And the second is that, it's that the surroundings are artificial. And needless to say, I do not mean the dynamic sublime in the Kantian sense of the word, but the artificial sublime through the omnipresence of which a human work can be experienced as a, a sublime surrounding. So Valerie Socrates leaps with one sentence straight to the heart of modern aesthetics. Because the latter, and uh, it, it uh, squares directly to the enigma of the total artwork, because the latter, in keeping with the avant-garde ambitions, grasps the environment as a whole, and the beholder can no longer absorb it from the bourgeois, vantage point of standing opposite it. In view of the temple in which I stand, being in the world precisely means being in the work of another. And indeed, it even means being consumed by the artistic greatness. And it is, it is a coincidence that Socrates makes use of the expressions that are reminiscent of the speech of the former tent maker, Apostle Paul. You remember this famous speech on the Areo Park where he's talking about a God in whom we live, move, and are. In Lutheran translation, uh, the words are and a God in whom we live, live, and sind. I do not know if the Zwinglian tradition allows uh, Lutheran uh, qu quotations. Uh, but the, the, the quality, the almost holy, uh, holy quality of, of Im immersion uh, is, is very well evoked here. Uh, and, uh, and Paul uh, made here a, 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 a kind of act of pirate hermeneutics when he talked from, the, from this altar of the unknown God uh, in essence and pretended that he, this altar was already prepared for the arrival of Christ. Yeah. And Valery knows very well what, he's, what he is quoting. Yeah. And the same can, so Valery, be said of second uh, art genre, name, namely music, then being inside the work of man as fishes are in the sea, being entirely immersed in it, living in it and belonging to it. Did you not live in a mobile edifice, incessantly renewed and reconstructed within itself, and entirely dedicated to the transformations of a soul, none other than the soul of the extensional itself? And did not those moments and their ornaments and those dances without dancers and those statues bodiless and featureless seem to surround you, slave you as you were of the general presence of music, where you're not enclosed along with it, nay forcibly locked up like a putia in her chamber of vapors. And the explication of dwelling by the theory of the surrounding art world thus leads directly to an elaboration of an aesthetic totalitarianism or the voluntary submission to the man-made environment. And in both, the reference to the aesthetics of the sublime comes immediately to bear. There are also two arts in which enclose man in man, one in stone and in air, and each of them fills our knowledge and our space with artificial truth. And modernity, what is it in this respect other than an experiment conducted to prove that it is but one step from the sublime to the uh, everyday experience, to banality? Then at the same time when Valerie was jotting down these observations, the movie 
the main medium of the nascent mass culture that was to unfold as an overwhelming medium was still in its infancy. We write the year 1921. But it was purposefully working to provide the arrangement for mass consumable immersive daydream experiences. It was working to enslave the eye and transform the organ of distanced observation into one of immersion in a quasi-tactile milieu. And at the same time, in the Bauhaus in Weimar, people had started under the banner of design to negotiate an integral manner of accessing the environment in which the everyday uh, life is lived. And not only music as a, is a dom domanic, demonic domain, as Thomas Mann had remarked, but spatial design also refers, like architecture, to that trivial uncanniness of permanent or occasional belonging to an environment thoroughly shaped by man. And these arts explicate the dwelling at places by means of immersion plans that are nothing other than enslavement proposals for the consumers of the total situation. And through them, habitation is seen as a welcome subjection to the ambient. And to the extent to which apartments are installations or assembled immersion plans, they explain existence as a three-dimensional task. Installations, like towns and apartments, are the aesthetic explication of embedding. And other things participate in the two basic value of aesthetic judgment. One says of embeddings in the pleasant and banal that they are beautiful or homely, and embeddings in the awful and the uncanny that they are sublime or uncomfortable. And in the course of the 20th century, these explications of dwelling became productive to the extent that the design of immersion, alias interior design, was limited to the living spaces of individuals and the few families and cooperatives. But the immeasurable and constantly burgeoning volume of popular literature on interior decorations, on living with style, on modernizing old buildings, on luxury kitchens and bathrooms, on air conditioning, on the culture of lightning, furniture, and the design of holiday homes indicates across how broad a front the message of embedding in a self-chosen micro-milieu as the actual ther therapeutic maxim of the second half of the 20th century found an audience. And an entire interior industry is at hand to trigger such needs and differentiate such standards. And telling this awareness of embedding was suddenly depoliticized <coughs> post-1945 and withdrew from the sublime collectivist sales as if people no longer wanted to hear that they are arts that enclose man within man. It is as if the collective memory has preserved the intuitive insight that the greater the entities comprised through immersion in the common ground, the more powerful the totalitarian temptation. And even if individual artists continue to experiment with dwelling in the sublime by surrounding themselves with, with sterility and horror, their exercises now remain limited to a private domain or the best to a subculture. If one day, someday, someone is able to reconstruct how the demons of the 20th century were unlashed, then the stress will be put on the efforts of the totalitarian leaders to expand the embedding situations of apartments to cover 
the entire situations of the people and the collective. And classical totalitarianism was a synthesis of apartment and Gesamtkunstwerk imposed from above. And the state, usurped by a clique, imposes itself as a total installation and demands of the citizens their unreserved immersion. And in the East, the party functioned as a transitional quantity for these embrasures of the whole, while in Germany it was the army that performed the task. They gave birth to the super flat shares that were staged as Nazi or socialist collectives. But after this dissolution, the customary form of residential totalitarianism joined forces with liberal mass culture. And it is now to be seen in the trend of blanket do-it-yourself stores that force anyone doing their own living space to choose from the same color ranges of tiles and shelves and switches and mattresses. And the do-it-yourself stores are the main suppliers of Western post-totalitarianism. And with a clear message, do not live with the whole. Outfit your own interior, alone with a few others, but remain recognizable and behave similarly. And the fact that you are then surrounded everywhere by furniture that is as good as interchangeable seems to be the lesser evil for those involved. I will not go on to uh, deliver uh, the dynamic definition of the apartment as a spatial Im immune system. I think uh, it can be understood uh, al already now. But let me, let me uh, go, go down uh, to my con con conclusions. Yeah. If houses of the modern times are form in which the immunizing quality of housing complexes are explicated, then should we not expect that the architecture of modernism manifests a debate over the right definition of immune space. Do houses in our age not have to morph into material symbols of the battle between isolation interests and demands for integration? Are the apartments of our age then not the evidence of a civilizing project that places the reformatting of humans of immunity and integral spaces on the agenda. And all we can be sure of is that the linkage of immunity and community needs to be rethought since residential and business relations seek to ensure the liberation of single persons living alone. And just as life in the age of naked life could be defined as a successful phase, the successful phase of an immune system, of a biochemical immune system, so the existence of man now describes the successful phase of a single person household. Yeah. But what we call people or society they also have to be defined as success, successful forms of, ur, of urban life. So I come to my uh, conclusions, uh, and they uh, have to do with the inner contradiction of uh, big city dwellings, big cities and wealthy nations share one problem, they attract more arrivals than they virtually can manage. And in doing so, they deteriorate their immune system qualities. And they will have to learn to play a sensible role in the drama of the future. To save life quality by intelligent methods of deglobalization, 
of disembedding and de-urbanization. De de you know. I think that the impossibility will take the lead with regard to the improbability, but nevertheless, uh, we will remain within the big city culture because the, the trust of climbing Mount Im improbably is a dynamic tr trust that, and that means uh, the height of the impossible will dim be diminished as much as the highest peak of improbability will, requ will require. So, and this is, as strange as it might sound, an optimistic argument that we shall not be confronted with, with absolutely uh, unsolvable problems because the, the height of the improbability Will, will almost, in, in the reach of, of human efforts uh, to, to reach the possible peak. So uh, there are still good reasons uh, in our ability to climb Mount Im Improbable under the condition that, the, that Mount Improbable as such we no longer reach that, that, such heights of impossibility that we believe to see right now. You know, but take 100 years more time for planning and you will see that, that these peaks uh, will be flattening <coughs> and the capacity of climbing will be at the height of the necessary. In the meantime, you are ready with your own conference uh, and you, uh, you are free to uh, make a contribution by a, a, a written essay uh, addressed to the organizer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, no, you can stay here. You can stay here for a minute. You have to stay right here for just a second. So, um, Sasha, you need a you need a handheld or something. Here we got a handheld for you. Does this work? No, you have to use this one. He'll 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 make it work for you. So, we have time to take one or two questions, if you're capable. I'm still trying to think of the impossible and the improbable, <laughs> and which is which, and where I'm climbing and where I'm sliding, <laughs> because I'm not sure where I'm heading with that. But I'm going to let Sasha have a comment on this one, because you, you can deal with this one. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> a little bit out of my league. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter Sloterdijk. We are climbing, at the moment, the impossible. And I don't know if we, if we know where we are going, but we try to give some hints, to develop some methods, maybe methodologies. And Aristoteles was clear at the time, and nature is stronger than we are. And saying this, I'm on my way to climb the impossible <laughs> with, the, with the team. Anyhow, thank you so much for your contribution. And we are really proud that you have been here. And I know it was not so easy, even the travel from, what was it, Berlin to Zurich can be also kind of impossible, as I understood yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, we are coming to an end of uh, this first day. And uh, I'm struck a little bit 
fatigued, you can say, on the other side. I think you feel the same. <clears throat> and, yeah, is it, is it positive what we're doing? Is it negative? Where are we going through? Still so many questions open at the moment. And I hope our younger generation tomorrow will give us some insights huh, tomorrow's day, open some windows, and they climb the impossible. They do it. In that sense, my battery is empty. <laughs> but just for the moment, I'm recharging quickly. Thank you so much for attending. And We're not done yet. See We're not done yet. We're not done yet. Sorry. You, you do that? I'm going to do that really fast. Okay. Faster than I do? Nope. But I'll be slower than you, but you can hang out for a second. So um, I also want to thank you very much for the Mountain Problem, Mountain Possible. And a few things which I would like to reflect very quickly, which was on the day, which I heard beginning with our leaders and here, a few words, respect, rethinking, relearning. Also for me, just this last one, rethinking and relearning about impossible, what's improbable, and how we have to, for ourselves, define what we think is improbable and what's impossible when we talk about the future of the city. And this is what I think when I think of it, the work you were doing as mayor. I'm sure many thought it was impossible and became improbable as you set those goals with leadership. And I think that's for me, was also a really important lesson to take away, which is also the leadership and the leadership we have here in the room. And the leadership, but it's intellectual, emotional, political, the leadership and the thoughtful leadership. I would have a question. Oh, no. One, one Say, I gave him a moment to think. That's always dangerous, yes. I have, a, I have a little question because I heard a new topic, de-urbanize, from you. Can you elaborate for a moment? Because what actually is happening is... It's the contrary, to my opinion. And I would be happy to know a little bit more about what you understand on the de-urbanization. In, in most situations, when it comes to the question of modernization, modern cities, and especially big cities, uh, I, I quote a book th that appeared um, a decade ago, uh, approximately, from an, I think, an American Australian author whose name is Doug Sanders. You might know it. Uh, it it's the name of the, the title of the book is "A Rival City," and it's the best description of of uh, modern the tr modern tragedy of uh, of the city. Because uh, Doug Sanders uh, was successful in a point when Oswald Spengler failed. Spengler came up with the promise to be able uh, to write the history of the future in advance, uh, which was obviously a, a failure because he. <laughs> Yeah, uh, because he was not able to uh, to find the distinction between uh, modernization mod uh, by technology in general and the end game of the Faustian culture. Uh, he, he he committed a huge c confusion and he took something which is a general process on on, on a uh, earthwide scale uh, just for the the last days. Of the, of the Faustian soul. That was a, a major error, and that is why uh, historiography in, ad, in advance remained un, uh, uncapable. But Doug Sanders did something much more plausible. He described the, the European evolution between 1800 and 1950. And what he observed was simply the de of the Western civilization. 
in Goethe's times, 1800, let us say, when, when, when Goethe was 51. Uh, this is a nice date of reference. Uh, uh, when Goethe was 51, 82, or 83 per percent of German population were still uh, living in agr agrarian uh, con conditions uh, and very often directly uh, from agriculture. 1950 in Germany, there was still 5% left in, the, in this original conditions. And his prognosis was very clear that what happened in, in the Western civilization through the possibilities opened up by our beginning of burning the subterranean forest. Uh, that is something that is repeating itself with a fatal or irresistible force every, everywhere else in the world. And the, 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 the huge political theme of, of migration yeah, is, is mitigated for us by the fact that the most migrations do not happen uh, beyond borders between nation states. But within modern nation states, the biggest migration is in, in China. The second uh, huge migration is, is in India, in, in, in Indonesia, which, which is a, a, a fantastically artificial construction. Uh, uh, it was, by the way, the pattern uh, to, uh, that helped Benedict Anderson to, to, to forge uh, his co concept uh, as an, as, uh, as, uh, as an, of the nation as a, as a fictional a entity, yeah. because he had that before his eyes, 300 different people all of a sudden integrated in, in one common political project, yeah. 1945. Yeah under the guidance uh, of an artificial religion, a little bit of humanism, a little bit of socialism, a little bit of, of, of Buddhism and, 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 he, and he, he, Hinduism. Yeah. It, 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 uh, it was a perfect cuvee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but who knows if it will still work in, in 20 years, in 50 years and, and, and so on. Uh, this, uh, I quote the, the case of Indonesia because it's also one of these uh, inner migration country, countries which help us to reduce the dimensions uh, of migration as a general phenomenon. You know? As long as the, most, the biggest part of migration happens inside nation states, you know? uh, our uh, asylum system you know? will not be over that much overstretched. Then it, it would, ha would happen if all these migrations were transnational. Yeah. So, Doug Sanders uh, made this prognosis uh, that the, the whole 21st century will, will belong to a dynamics of, of that kind. And we shall observe de agrarization on a, on a large, uh, large scale. And we shall see uh, the, the fact that modern cities, which are cities without city walls, will be unable uh, to stop their own pool function. That, that is uh, the second chapter of the tragic urban urbanism. Yeah. We, we are not only uh, um, living in cities without uh, a wall uh, against death, but also uh, against these kind of migrations caused by inner de -agrarization. And in that context, uh, this um, um, a little bit scandalous, sound, scandalously sounding word of de-urbanization uh, is, is to be defined. In, in, in the Western world, we are living already in a, in a, in a cycle of what you could call uh, uh, the second green. 
The first green was an agrarian world. Now we, we live in a world where many uh, city dwellers decide uh, to turn their backs to, to cities uh, and to, to live in uh, com commuter cities. That means in a, in a one hour or two hours distance from the, megalo from the megalopolis. That's what I call the, se the second queen. So you, outside you find, in, in the meantime, you, have, you find the, se the same uh, advantages uh, you have as a, as a city, city dweller, uh, but no longer the disadvantages. That's what I, I, I meant uh, when I uh, used the term of de Yeah. But let, let us assume that Marco Polo came to Bogota. <laughs> yeah. After his return uh, to Venice, he would have pretended uh, that not only ha he had a, a seen a city of several million inhabitants, yeah. that's why the, the, the people in Venice called him Messa Milione. That's a, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so he he would have come back as a Messa Mione from from Bogota, yeah. <laughs> but but also as someone who uh, reported something from the from the uh, peak of impossibility turned into into simple improbability. Yeah. And the, maybe a, a mayor is a difference. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, Peter and Sasha, thank you so very much for sharing your thoughts with us. And I hope you'll be able to stand out with us and have a glass of wine yeah. at the Swiss Apero. All right, we heard that. Excellent. So let us thank Peter and for <laughs> here again. <laughs>